Thank you, glad you enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> uh, hi, Humphrey, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, can I just first of all say um, that I have the most immense respect for um, people like Anne-Marie Morris um, and the Conservatives who have put their future political careers on the line to come over and campaign for Leave. It shows that they are principled, they're putting their country before their party, and they're potentially the future of their country before the future of their political careers, and I, I absolutely applaud them for it. Um, let's not forget, I have to say, all of those who have done the opposite. Um, uh, there are quite a few people who are quite blatantly putting their um, uh, political careers before the future of their country. And let's, as we go forward through, uh, in past this referendum, let's all remember who they are. My, my own MP uh, comes out with the same line, exactly identical to several other MPs. I've always been a Eurosceptic, you know. But having listened to the arguments, on balance, I do think we would be stronger, safer, better off in a reformed EU. Well, I'm sorry, but I'd rather have Ken Clark. Ken Clark at least knows what he believes in, ladies and gentlemen, doesn't he? Yeah. Let's not forget. Now, um, I am not a conservative, so I'm able to say a number of things probably that Amory wouldn't, uh, wouldn't countenance. Um, can I just first of all, can I ask, who here has not yet made up your mind? A, a, a few people have still not made up their minds how they're going to vote. Fine. Um, for those of you that have made up your mind, what I'm going to try and do is to provide just a few things. I mean, bearing in mind we are, we are only, what, 11, 11 or 12 days now from uh, polling day. What I want to get across to you really is not you know, great reams of argument, but a few things to be able to say to other people to, to convince them to make their minds up. Um, I know Anne-Marie uh, had the uh, economics brief and I had the immigration brief, but I've, there's been a new report here this morning from an expert panel, um, and I want to tell you the results. Um, uh, it's a very interesting stuff. Thick cut marmalade, ladies and gentlemen. Thick cut marmalade uh, by 2030 is going to be down in price by 13%. So this is currently three pound forty-five. In 2030, that will be three quid. Um, uh, uh, Parmesan and uh, sun-dried tomato bread mix is going to be down by 12% by 2030 in price. Okay. Uh, this um, Italian-made whole wheat spaghetti. It's going to be down 14% in price by 2030. Okay? Uh, that means your average weekly shop will be down by £7.93 by 2030. That's annually you will all be saving, on average, £463.71. Uh, a few more things that the panel has discovered. Uh, there will be a boom in the fashionability of Venetian blinds and French windows, which have been out of fashion for quite a while. In our rivers and streams, there will be an enormous increase in amphibians. So frogs, toads, and newts will be having a massive population explosion in 2030. And drinking water will be 26% more refreshing in 2030, ladies and gentlemen, if we go for Brexit. Okay, have you all heaved in those figures? You all understand why Brexit now is necessary? Thank you, because our expert panel comprises 100% of this country's astrologers, ladies and gentlemen, and you must believe what they say. What I'm really talking about, ladies and gentlemen, is lies, damned lies, and treasury statistics. We, uh, William and I had the great pleasure a week or so ago to be in a meeting in Plymouth with Lord Owen. Do you remember David Owen, who was a foreign secretary and the founder of the SDP, uh, leader of it, and a great Europhile in his day. And what was really interesting was to see how he has changed and why he has changed his opinion. And one of the things he said was he could not understand why there had not been a spate of resignations of civil servants from the Treasury, as they have been utterly corrupted by having to produce utterly bogus and nonsense figures at the behest of George Osborne to fight this ridiculous campaign. And I commend to you, ladies and gentlemen, a book by a chap called Peter Oval uh, for a few years ago called The Rise of Political Lying. And it's a very interesting book. He traces the point at which politicians went from, people, from being people who were notoriously economical with the truth 
to actually, in government, believing that telling complete lies was an acceptable thing to do, provided you got the right result. So what have we been told? We've been told that £4,300 will come off every household's GDP by 2030, as if there was such a thing as a household's GDP. That we will be cost 820,000 jobs by 2030 if we come out of the EU. That house prices will go down by £18,000. The new one this week, a £150.6 billion black hole in Brexiteers' spending plan. So I don't know whether you saw that one. It's an arcane idea. A 100, I'll repeat it. A £150.6 billion black hole in the Brexiteers' spending plan. This it disregards the fact that the Brexiteers don't have any spending plans, but I'm particularly fascinated by the point six, aren't you? 150 billion point six. Now, when you see this, oh, the other one, the beautiful thing, 137 pounds a year off everyone's pension, or 32,000 pounds out of everyone's average pension pot if we come out of the European Union, which I'm delighted to say that the great Andrew Neil actually persuaded the Chancellor to confess on his interview two days ago was utterly nonsense on the grounds that the Chancellor himself legislated for a triple lock on pensions that would ensure that that couldn't possibly ever happen. We have been treated to extraordinary amounts over the, late, uh, over the last few weeks, ladies and gentlemen, of all economists agree, all leading economists agree about X, Y, and Z. And it's just one, one thing that I want to want you to take away from this. Economists cannot predict the future. There's an old saying about economists, they are specialists in predicting the past. Actually, what they are is historians who can't agree. But the point is, if economists could predict the future, you'd only ever need one of them. Wouldn't you? And there are hundreds of igniters. And they're all getting on this group thing bandwagon. And the other thing is, if economists could predict the future, we had one of them, and we predicted the future, our economy would work perfectly. Now, the Treasury, according to George Osborne, is able to tell us exactly how our economy will grow between now and 2030. Exactly how it will grow between now and 2030. That's broadly 60 quarters. And yet he has failed to meet his spending targets in every budget. The last three quarters have been way off. So these economists can predict 60 quarters in the future, and they can't even manage to predict the past. It's extraordinary. Anyway, sorry, my, I'm sorry for riffing on your brief, but um, my brief is immigration. Now what I don't propose to do, ladies and gentlemen, is to go into lots and lots of details about immigration, why it's a good thing or a bad thing, whether it is a net benefit of the economy or not. Everybody disagrees about these things. What I will say is, 70% and more of the population of this country, when asked, say they believe that we should control immigration. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right? 70% of people. Because they understand that immigration has an effect on housing, house prices, jobs, wages, health facilities, schools, traffic, benefits, although the benefits thing is a bit of a red herring. But almost every aspect of life is affected by how many people there are in your community. And therefore, that's why the vast majority of people in this country do understand, and way beyond the people that are going to vote for Brexit, do understand that we should control immigration into our country. Now, David Cameron says that we can, as a member of the European Union, control immigration into the country. But that is not true. I'm hesitating to use the word again, but it is simply not true. And the reason it is not true is because as a member of the European Union, we are not allowed to control immigration into the country. And in fact, interestingly, that treasury economic model that, I have, that, that George Osborne has been running Actually, as part of its, um, its worries and clankings to come out with these bizarre figures, has itself predicted that um, there will be 3 million more people in the country by 
2030. That means an average net increase of, uh, of immigration uh, uh, into the country over those years of 214,000. So even George Osborne's Treasury model says you cannot control immigration. The reason actually is why we can't do it is a thing called the free movement of people. Now the free movement of people is something that we are told we must have if we are going to be allowed to trade with the European Union. Um, I'm sure William will talk with, uh, later about the idea of being allowed to trade with the European Union, uh, so I won't go into it in great detail. But the point is, it is not necessary, and I, and I said, I'm going to try to stick to facts in everything that I tell you. It is not necessary to have the free movement of people to trade with the European Union. There are currently 137 countries in the world that have a trade agreement with the European Union, of which four have in that agreement a clause about the free movement of people. They are Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Switzerland. Of those four, Liechtenstein has a derogation saying it doesn't have to do it because it's too small. And Switzerland voted to get rid of it two years ago. Okay? So you don't have to have free movement of people in order to have to trade with the European Union, or indeed even to have a trade agreement with the European Union. Looking around the world, there is no free movement of people in the North American Free Trade Association. There is no free movement of people in the ASEAN uh, Trade Association. All nations control their borders, ladies and gentlemen. All. Including the EU. Right? The point is that the EU is not committed on principle to the concept of the free movement of people. How do I know this? Because currently in the Balkans and the Mediterranean, it is doing its absolute damage to stop it. <coughs> The EU believes, as we believe, that a nation should control its borders. The EU sees itself as a nation. We see ourselves as a nation, and we take the same view. We should be able to control our borders. So, free movement of people is not a principle for the European Union. It's not a take it or leave it. It's a negotiating point. And we have to understand that. There is no reason at all why we should have to have the free movement of people in order to be able to trade with the European Union. And interestingly, David Cameron said to the Conservative Party conference in 2014, it will be at the very heart of my renegotiation strategy. Britain, I know you want this sorted. So I will go to Brussels. I will not take no for an answer. And when it comes to free movement, I will get what Britain needs. Now, to be absolutely fair to the Prime Minister, he did not take no for an answer. He didn't ask the question so that he couldn't have no for an answer. Now, one, one other thing that we've been thought of, this is the Australian Style Points based system. Now, we know that we've been talking about this for quite some time, and, and every time we talk about this, actually, um, a room, quite often a room full of people who have been quite sceptical about um, immigration controls, um, will say, well, what, what do you mean by that? And we say, well, Australia is our points based system, and the room will tend to go, oh, yeah, good, brilliant. Now, we've been fought on this at the moment. The Remain side is saying, well, the point about the Australian style system is it's led to an increase in, in, in immigration into Australia. Well, so what? The point is, that's what the Australians chose. The Australian point space system is not pick a number. What it means is that they have a minister for immigration and a department, and they collect information about what their economy requires. And on a dynamic basis, year by year and through the year, they make decisions about who they want to have in the country and what, how to ascribe the points for the skills and the attributes and so on that those people have to offer. So, our immigration could go up after an Australian points based system was, was introduced. It could go up, it could go down. The point is, we would decide. And that is the whole point. All of this red herring we're getting at the moment about, yeah, but how many? Yeah, but how many? How many? How many do you want? It's completely irrelevant. We are not arguing for a number 
of people to come in or, into this country. We are certainly not arguing for no immigration. That would be insane. What we are saying is, can we please have the ability to decide? Like every other country in the world. Now, I said I'm going to stick to facts. And part of my brief is security. And there are, there are not too many facts about security. So I'm just going to, I'm going to stick with facts. First of all, Turkey. There's been some nonsense talked about Turkey. And Turkey is a relevant factor when it comes to talking about immigration and security. There are 75 million people in Turkey. Turkey is 93% in Asia. David Cameron says that Turkey will not join the EU before the year 3000. He actually said that a week or so ago. George Osborne, I think, said not today. A bit of a difference between those two things. But what I want to, to quote to you is what David Cameron said to Turkey in 2010, when he was there. Right? Depends where he is, is what he said. He said, what I think about what Turkey has done to defend Europe as a NATO ally, and what Turkey is doing today in Afghanistan alongside our European allies, it makes me angry that your progress towards EU membership has been, can be frustrated in the way that it has been. My view is clear. I believe it is just wrong to say that Turkey can guard the camp but not be allowed to sit in a tent. So I will remain your strongest possible advocate for EU membership and for greater influence at the top table of European diplomacy. Right? Turkey has visa-free access from this month to the European Union. Ladies and gentlemen. Right? Visa-free access from this month. It has an accession path into the EU, which has been laid down for a number of years, and the end date of which remains 2020. So these are facts, ladies and gentlemen. You have to decide whether you think that David Cameron standing in Ankara saying, I will be your biggest advocate for the EU membership and pave a path to Brussels for you, or David Cameron standing in Britain saying, those people will not join till the year 3000 and we have a veto over it. Which of those is true? I can't tell you. Because those are two different positions. But I can tell you the facts. And that is that, in answer to a written question by uh, our MP Douglas Carswell to the Foreign Office Minister David Lillington, in April it remains UK policy that Turkey should become a member of the EU. Security. I mentioned that security, facts on security are in short supply. We can scaremonger about security. I'm not going to. I am genuinely sick of the scaremongering that has been involved in this campaign. I mean, object, it, it is nauseating. <laughs> so I'm just going to give you one or two facts. First of all, that the head of Europol, who is a man incidentally campaigning very strongly for us to remain, he's a Brit, says that there are 5,000 jihadis now in the European Union and we don't know where they are. Um, they, uh, my... Um, Part of you, Nigel Farage has come in for a certain amount of stick this week for, his, for remarks about Cologne. I just want to tell you what he did say. He said, there are some very big cultural issues. Asked whether mass sex attacks on the scale of Cologne could happen in Britain. Mr. Farage replied, it depends if they get EU passports. It depends if we vote for Brexit or not. It is an issue. So I'm just quoting that because there's been a lot of interpretation of what he might have said. Another fact I want to leave you with is about the UK's ability and uh, our, our position in the world stage and the European stage in defence and security. One of the key facts that I want you to take away is that we have the fourth largest defence and security budget in the world. That's the UK. Right? The fourth largest defence and security budget in the world. And we are a member of something called the Five Eyes. Now the Five Eyes are the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. And those are generally recognized globally to be the intelligence nexus that actually is fighting the war against the new kind of threat uh, and the new terror. Okay? GCHQ in Cheltenham is considered to be the best installation of its kind in the world. It is certainly, by a very, very long way, the best installation in Europe. 
So European security relies on us, not the other way round. Okay? Just let's make that clear. And the reason I'm saying this is I'm, I'm just trying to deal in facts because we have 11 days to go. And I know you people want to be able to just distill down what is true in this argument. And when you're talking to other people, you need to be able to say, to tell them what is true. Finally, on the security and defence side, the EU army. And um, again, I, I, I said I would only deal in facts. And this is another one where you, you can get all kinds of interpretations. I understand that a paper called the Global Strategy on Foreign, Foreign and Security Policy needs to be tabled in the European Union on the 24th of June. And that much has been made about that in the press. I don't know what's going to be in it, um, because it hasn't been tabled yet. So I'm not going to try and pretend. But what I will say to you is, there is already an EU naval force, and incidentally a, a Royal Navy ship serving in the EU naval force two or three years ago watched uh, whilst uh, some people were taken off their yacht by Somali pirates actually in the lee of the ship. Didn't do anything about it because their rules of engagement didn't allow it. Um, an EU naval force, an EU air transport command, an EU military staff, EU battle groups, and EU rapid reaction forces. And all of those already contain British forces. So at the risk of departing from this purely factual, I have to say I now have a vision of David Cameron rather like, on the subject of the EU army, rather like that chap Comical Alley, do you remember him in, in, the, uh, in the war in Iraq, who stood proudly looking into a camera saying, there are no American tanks in Baghdad, while one rolled past him. <laughs> so finally, ladies and gentlemen, all I want to say is, in the campaign that we have experienced over the last two months, particularly the information that's been produced by the government, I have had my resolve as a Brexiteer very severely tested. And the reason why I say that is this. As a Brexiteer, my number one reason for wishing to leave the European Union is to get back self-government. The reason why my resolve has been tested is because when I see how that government has been performing in this campaign, I have to say to myself, yeah, but not then. <laughs> okay? And I apologize, Andrew. I, I'm more than happy if you, you know, would, would like to take over as the Prime Minister. But honestly, the degree of mendaciousness and deceit that has been produced by our cabinet ministers, some of them, not all of them, but some of them, has been mind-boggling. But, on the plus side, I have at the same time had my faith in the British public massively increased. Because as this stuff has been produced, we've been able to watch the British public, who, to be fair, are still saying to us, we have no idea what most of this stuff is about, we wish you would tell us the truth. But as this stuff is coming out, you can watch the British public going, you're out of the giraffe. You're not expecting me to swallow that hole. And that's just wonderful. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, today, in one of the leading polls on the referendum, the Brexit side is 10% up. <laughs> I hope that that has gone some way towards helping our um, two members of the audience who are not entirely sure which way to vote. Um, and if not, I hope you will by the time we finish the questions today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve.